Hello, everybody. This is Andre. Welcome to the Marketing Innovation Show. Today with us, we have Stefan Gergely. He's one of the best tech and blockchain guys I know. Uh, and I'm super happy to have him on the podcast again. Welcome back, Stefan. How's it going? Hey, man. I'm all good. At home, still with a shaved head, as you can see. <laughs> How are you? Very good. Very good as well. Uh, just uh, had a very pumped morning and now back in business with uh, with the podcast. And I'm super, super uh, excited for our episode today. Cool. So uh, just for the people that maybe haven't seen already the episode that we did back in the day, um, tell us a bit about you and about the adventures that you run, uh, the adventures that you embarked on re uh, recently, and what are you involved with at the moment? Sure. So uh, one of my starting points was uh, being a partner in Under Development Office. That's a product-oriented development agency. We're focused on mobile technologies, web technologies, But I think one of the things that really sets us apart is our focus on cutting edge technologies. This is why we were one of the first companies in Europe to develop blockchain technology as a service. And that got us to grow quite quickly uh, with clients all over the world. And that's the niche that we're best known for right now. Um, and I'm also, you know, always stepping into all sorts of ventures because I think as a, as a hustler in these days, you can't just have one job. Uh, and right now, the latest thing I'm embarking on is uh, with a friend of mine, Augustin Giano. We're starting a company called Daimly. It's a data-oriented company. Um, we're making a platform where people can transparently monetize their data, and advertisers or hustlers can uh, can promote their business in a data-oriented manner really, really quickly and really, really easily. Mm -hmm. Super cool. Okay, so uh, just to to let everybody know what we're gonna be doing today, because it's a bit of a more different type of episode than we have traditionally or that maybe you guys are used to. So um, as, uh, as the title says, today we are going to be focusing on how, how marketing channels and tactics can be changed post-COVID and how this might affect the traditional marketing mix, uh, the traditional ways of advertising and so on. Uh, but rather than just uh, talking about it, uh, what Stefan and I are going to be doing is um, put our entrepreneur hats on as well as the marketing and tech knowledge that we have together. And we will be starting with a brainstorming session. So this is something that we haven't done before or anything like that. So it's happening 100, 100% here. Um, and from that brainstorm, uh, where we're going to be discussing technologies, what's cutting edge today, and how this might be uh, turning out in a couple of months uh, in terms of mass usage, from here we'll be making some scenarios and trying to guess the things that might be happening a couple of months down the line, as well as how brands could tap into these potential trends today so that they can um, get a competitive advantage in the market. So, um, cool. Let's, uh, let's make a start on it. Stefan, I think that a good um, place to start would be maybe to talk about the mobile consumption, mobile technology. This is something that you have loads of, of experience as well in. And I think that we can, um, we can start from this as a basis because we already know this has been growing loads over the past years. Uh, let's see where we are with it at the moment. I think, I think at the moment, like specifically at the moment when we're recording this, uh, we're in like a pause state. Uh, we're in a time in which um, everyone can just lay back for a bit. Everyone wants to lay back. Everyone wants to take advantage of this quarantine, apart from the very few outliers who are using this time to perfect certain skills and some knowledge and uh, hats off to them. I think most people are just saying, all right, we have some, a period of time in which everyone can just chill out and everyone's taking a break from things. So that's why Netflix numbers are booming. Uh, TikTok numbers are booming, but it's heavily consumption of content oriented. People just want to hear stories. I don't think they really want to be sold stuff. Of course, online businesses have grown uh, in a very uh, have grown slightly because people do buy stuff out of boredom at home. But I wouldn't say it's like a mass trend of let's just buy everything we can. It's a sweep, an online sweepstakes of of, of sorts. <laughs> um, but of course, that's bound to change soon. There's a gravity towards people doing things like the people are not gonna just do just sit around and do nothing forever um so i think this is a great window of opportunity to take the time like we're doing right now and just to just brainstorm how the future is going to look like and uh yeah this is going to be a brainstorming episode so good luck to the person editing this 
because uh, they're going to have quite a lot of uh, moments to cut out. Um, but I think this is a great time for people, for companies to reevaluate how they've been investing their money since a lot of budgets are being cut right now to, you know, to make sure that the, there's liquidity over the long run. Um, so I think it's a great time for people to review their budgets, review their investments. And in a marketing standpoint, as I think you mentioned to me in a, in a discussion that we had, it's a great time for people to reevaluate how their marketing efforts and how their ROI is looking. Yeah, I think that's uh, right on spot. And I think that uh, let's see let's see where the discussion goes because <laughs> as, as it happened before, I don't think there's going to be so many uh, moments <laughs> because once we get okay. I think I think <laughs> we'll have some uh, very very nice um, uh, debates on uh, on subjects. But let's start with uh, mobile. I think so. Um, for example, from a marketing standpoint, is nothing new that most many people started to consume more mobile content. Uh, this platform has been growing loads. Um, what what do you feel? It's the state of mobile at the moment. Is it used enough or to its maximum capacity from a technological point of view? Well, what do you mean by mobile specifically? Yeah, man, I totally agree. I think that the way that people started to consume content as well as the amount of content that they consume on different platforms has been impacted a lot by this lockdown <laughs> and the remote working and everything. Also from my agency perspective, so working with clients every day, I see that many of them started to swap budgets, cut some of the budgets, as well as move them to different channels. So for, for example, moving offline stuff, obviously, to online and seeing how they can distribute better um, better ads in a more targeted way. And some of the ones that weren't already started to look into the personalization of ads and how you know uh, this can benefit their marketing. Um, let's look... Uh, I think that a good direction for us to start the brainstorming would be to see um, which channels have been impacted most and then to see which technologies maybe could be used better to to make this process more eff effective of delivering ads, delivering content and driving people through their purchase journey to say so. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, cool. And now I'd like to start um, with one of the things that we as marketers were expecting as and us as an agency were expecting from our clients. And that was, okay, everybody had their offline budgets and we were expecting them to get them from there and insert them into online and have a massive inflation here. But this is not exactly what happened. So in March, when this whole thing started, uh, people start basically started to renegotiate their contracts with outdoor, uh, but then the online budgets remained kind of the same. We expected this to grow, for example, now in April, but this was not necessarily the case, actually, uh, looking at the cost per conversion and um, purchase uh, cost of acquisitions and so on. So these sort of metrics that show the competitiveness in a market for specific keywords or sport for specific industries, we actually saw a slight drop over the, the past two weeks or so in terms of uh, the cost per action and so on, which basically indicates that in some spaces, so for example, specifically, let's say Romania, um, the, market, uh, the market has not been so competitive in this, um, in this period, which is a very good opportunity, for example, for brands to, to tap into the digital channels, which they would usually anyway, and get some advantages from here. But also another thing that I think people should remember is that because it's also an economic danger attached to this whole situation, people started to be more conservative in the way that they make purchases and uh, spend money in general. That would be an argument for the price of ads going up for the cost of action, so to speak, or the conversion, whatever you want to call it. Uh, which one? Well, the fact that so uh, there's less buying power, theoretically. Yeah. Well, actually, no, I think the fact of the matter is that there was not less light, less buying power yet. There might be less buying power in the future, like in the near future. Mm -hmm. So far, people are like, all right, it's the beginning of this quarantine. Let's buy whatever we need to, to stay at home, to blah, blah, buy it online. Uh, many merchants, advertisers did not get a chance to truly move their budgets and realize uh, what it would mean because probably it takes some form of decision which was postponed, of sorts, mm -hmm. these budget negotiations and so on and so forth internally within companies. But yeah, I also would have expected the, the, the price to go up like immediately. I would expect yeah, yeah. these hustler entrepreneurs to start advertising for everything. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I saw 
a lot of, but maybe it's just because I was targeted by it, was a lot of uh, courses and e-learning. I think that this is the sector that has seen a massive increase in the budgets here because everybody saw an opportunity now to push courses and to push trainings and so on. So this sector might be one of the ones that saw a higher cost per click, a cost per lead and so on. But otherwise, mainly, for example, in e-commerce, the cost for per sale for the goods that weren't very expensive, so not 1,000 pounds or euros purchases, but rather 100, 150. So this sort of purchases saw um, a lower cost per purchase, which can be, as you said, people just being indoors, not spending money anymore outdoors and wanting to get this... Um, the headphone or the whatever that yeah, they yeah, exactly. chance to do because they were going out clubbing and spending money on that, but now they're not. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, the headphones are a great example. My brother just did it and he was like, uh, oh yeah, so I wanted to get these headphones for a very long while. Now I haven't uh, been out for two weeks. I haven't spent money on beer and <laughs> clubs. <laughs> exactly. And so this was exactly the argument. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I just got these headphones. What do you think? I was like, yeah, well for you, good for you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's fair enough. It's a, it's a good point. And I think that uh, one one thing that sort of concerns me, but not necess- maybe concern is not the right word, uh, but it's just something that gets me thinking a lot, is with the lockdown, people saw a different way of living or of doing the things that they were traditionally doing anyway. So for example, working instead of go- mainly the people in the tech space or customer service uh, on the phone, and et cetera, uh, they saw that they can do the same thing that they were doing in an office from home. Maybe their bosses saw as well and companies in general. So once they get used to doing this from home for two months, let's say, um, while they'll be locked in, it's going to be probably very hard for them to start going again <laughs> every day in the office, going on the commute and so on. And usually this commute time would be a time where many advertisers would be pushing budget. So for example, on social, when we were publishing posts or some of the bigger advertisers were um, concentrating a lot of the, a lot of the budget would be during these times when people are on the tube or are driving, but everybody knows that people, when they're stuck in traffic, stay, stay on the phone and necessarily look out for billboards and outdoor advertising. So um, I think that the, effective, the effectiveness of some channels and the traditional ways of advertising during specific time, time frames, they are all going to be um, affected. So one of the points would be that maybe because, I mean, this was in in the past as well that people when they were outdoors they weren't interacting that interacting that much with their outdoor environment as they did with their mobile one always staring at the phones but also the ways that they will consume content let's say on social might be different not having that commute time then so maybe they are sleeping late or waking up late and then maybe advertisers should be looking at adjusting the timing of their ads Mm -hmm. what do you think yeah, that's. I mean, that's definitely an insight that you you would have, not me. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad I learned it now. Uh, so no, yeah, I think that makes sense. And um, well, it it kind of uh, creates an idea that we need to analyze all of these sort of micro trends, so to speak, these micro behaviors. Like, what's going to be the new ritual, the new commute? Because the commute to the to the workplace was was a ritual for everyone. Mm-hmm. You, know, you had these certain sets of things that you would do and it's a it's a therapeutic process in a sense for many people that have managed to master the process of the commute because for other ones for the others they just get unbelievably stressed <laughs> they fuck up their day only to do it on the way back again and that defeats the purpose uh they're going to be happy right now because they can stay home but they're going to have their own little their own little things they, you know it's the podcast that you're going to watch at home while making your coffee it's the these sorts of things uh, are going to be micro trends that, that advertisers are going to need to look out for. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, that's cool. But what about like more into the future? What does it look like? Because I'm one of the people that I liked being in the office. I like talking to people, to the developers that I work with. I have a daily call with, with our developers and it, it gets to me, you know, like I, I'm sitting behind my computer. I hung up and I go, uh, if that could have been, it, it, It's more efficient in a sense because the talkative people, because of how the connection works in a team call, they can't talk as much as they would before. Mm -hmm. 
you always have talkative people in, in, in teams and they can't talk as much because they can't get the message across because if you have a little bit of lag, whatever story it is you were telling, it gets fucked off. So uh, <clears throat> it's more efficient in a sense, but I think over the long run, having person-to-person contact and discussing issues that people come up with for, for team strength in these sorts of factors, mm-hmm. uh, being in real life exists. So I don't think, I think there are going to be some people out there just like I am that prefer yep. to go to the office that will happily take the commute. Uh, <clears throat> once the fear of, you know, once the, once the fear of this virus is over, of course, because right now we're afraid to touch people, mm-hmm. not in the, not in any <laughs> peculiar sense, but just uh, quite simply. Um, but once it's over, I think there are going to be a bunch of people that, that, that head into the office and that interact in real life. So offline advertising might not, no, sorry. Offline advertising is definitely not going to disappear completely. For sure. Right. And I think this is a good opportunity to take a look at it because I felt that it's always lacked certain, a certain something. You know, it's, it's just so simple. It's, it hasn't evolved at all. Like the billboard has not evolved from the person screaming, buy my fruit for a discount in the bazaar in Istanbul a thousand years ago. Uh, although one thing that I saw, um, you know, um, it was like a study done in China. Uh, as a disclaimer, I don't have too much insight into the Chinese marketing world because it's working a bit different. They have WeChat and it's uh, like brands that are communicating much more differently than they are in America or in Europe. But one thing that I, s- I was reading and I saw a little sort of video insight in is that they have started to develop um advertising like on tube screens that they are that are identifying people by their mobile devices and are able to share data with their mobile devices and therefore deliver ads that are relevant to those people based on the brands that they have interacted on WeChat with. So I think that that's some next level <laughs> next generation shit. Uh ha- have you heard uh about it? Uh, no, I haven't, but that's the, that's the direction I would go. I would say that anyway, but it's just a start because the thing is the only thing we're doing by, uh, by targeting, uh, physical ads, by targeting offline ads to people that look at them based on some technology like this, like, I don't know, whatever they, they would use a Bluetooth beacon. And I don't think that they would target the individual cause it's impossible. I think they would make an average of the people that are standing closer to that ad mm-hmm. and serve an ad that's closer tailored to that audience. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's not, it's not as efficient as an online ad where you can, in the same space, you can serve a different ad to each individual. Mm-hmm. Should you th- think that that's the, should an algorithm dictate that that's the case? Uh, if they do, if they did figure out, I, I don't know how they built that, but if they did but, figure out a way to serve a tailored ad to each individual looking at the ad, which again, I really don't think they did. Yeah, I, I don't think either because it, you can't have like more <laughs> ads in the same time on the same screen. Because it's not about that. Everybody. It's, I mean, you could filter it out through a certain, I don't know, if you use an AR technology, for instance, and you look at the ad through your phone, the physical ad, well, you are you are looking at it through a camera, but you can see something different than everyone else around you. Yeah. For instance. But that's kind of stupid because the, the whole purpose of an offline ad is to stumble upon it and see it while you're doing something else, not purposely take out your phone, point <laughs> it towards it, read your ad, and so on and so forth. So that while it may sound nice, and I'm quite sure there's going to be a startup out there who thinks that that's going to be a thing, it's not going to be a thing. Mm-hmm. Like, I have that on the record now, I guess, that I said it. Um, yeah. But although, uh, so going back from this, there's in Romania, there is a company that is uh, trying to develop and to integrate this sort of um, anal- analysis on customers' data and uh, facial recognition and stuff. Um, and they have mounted cameras in a couple of uh, places, also in Bucharest. And if I'm not wrong, one of them is in the tube uh, at in Unique Square Station, uh, one or two actually. And they are uh, analyzing or using face recognition mechanisms to make, to aggregate data, gain insight into the audience, and then teach the advertisers that are distributing ads through them uh, what ads should they be delivering at which points during the day, so that they are as relevant as they could to the audience. And I think that that's, for example, one upgrade of the traditional, let's say, outdoor advertising is definitely not as advanced as the Chinese stuff. But um, do you see this this sort of technologies may be potentially uh, or feasible in the today's market? 
in terms of the actual logistics and implementation? Is the world ready for them? I think this is when I think this is when it needs to start. Uh, because the thing is in, in advertising as I've as I'm not as I've learned, as I'm learning uh, with Daimly, um, is you need a lot of data. Mm-hmm. Like you need a lot, a lot, a lot of data. So the sooner we start processing it, no matter how raw it is, no matter how crude it is, the better. Uh, and it's, it's going to be better for the consumer because at the end of the day, because there are going to be, there are companies out there that do actually just want you to see. And if you're going to see an ad, they want you to see an ad that's, that, that might be relevant. Uh, we've gotten to this stigma that we hate ads, so to speak. Uh, a stigma which I understand uh, to a large degree. I mean, I was so happy when uh, YouTube Premium came out because I could no longer suffer to see two video ads back to back to some dumbass video game, like some mobile game with where there's just load, loads of useless explosions on the screen between some random, really, really cheaply designed items. Like I couldn't, I couldn't stand it anymore. So I was really happy when YouTube when YouTube Premium came out, but that. I was manipulated into that because YouTube purposely just uh, distributed multiple video ads to people for such a long time that they could no longer stand. I'm, I, I know for sure that somewhere there's a calculation that said, this is how much we need to fuck people over with ads for most of the people to buy YouTube premium when it comes out. And I'm it's sure. the same with Spotify as well. I think I'm also sure that they are doing it on purpose. Yeah. Um, so I'm definitely sure that's a thing, but there are definitely our advertising companies out there that genuinely want to serve the best content uh, that, that they can for you. And for that, they need data and that needs to start soon. So I think, I think that's okay. I think, uh, uh, you know, people are going to have to start getting used to these sorts of things anyway. That's the only way we're going to get rid of this stigma is just people getting used to the fact that, yeah, right. We are going to be recording certain reactions as long as we use a proprietary, sorry, as long as we use a technology that can guarantee some form of transparency or some form of security behind your data, a technology like blockchain, for instance. Uh, I'm not saying that full disclaimer, we're not using blockchain in Daimly now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is one of the, one of we do plan to do it in a sense. So I'm not saying that I'm not trying to promote it in a sense of like, yeah, use Daimly because it's already done now. But um, a technology that makes, that guarantees that people's data is held safely and transparently and they know what advertisers are getting. So they're not getting my name, my whatever. I think that's going to be very important in, in reducing the stigma and in moving forward and then to be able to serve new and more, much more in-depth advertising experiences. This is, one of the, this is one of the points that I wanted to touch on within this brainstorming. I think we're going to need to go much deeper uh, into, with ads into storytelling, into creating universes, into, uh, into pushing them across different platforms in a way that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Right now, like, think a little bit about how basic so many advertising campaigns are like the, like the majority of them out there in the world i i genuinely don't understand like those mobile games that i was talking about earlier they push millions of dollars into really really senseless ads like with that sort of budget a, a, a creative innovative agency could do something amazing like they could craft the universe of ads with stories and characters and whatever the fuck you want and i think what where the offline world of ads is going to move towards, apart from, of course, getting these reactions, uh, um, what else? Uh, tailoring ads towards certain communities of people based on who's passing by with technology like, like Bluetooth beacons. I think what they should be doing is also building upon their other ads that they have in other places. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be cool for me to see, instead of an ad, as a video ad on YouTube, for instance, that I, where I know that I have to watch at least, I don't know how long it is. Five, five seconds. Five seconds, yes. Something like that. Um, I would like to see in the real world a continuation to a short sort of cinematic or story that was started for me in that before. And if, you ha- if that means actually promoting your product in the third one, in the third ad, which I might see after a week or two somewhere else, it might end up based on some calculations, much more efficient than just saying, yo, buy this, it's cheaper and it's better for you right now. Dude, just do it. Just gotta, just do it now. So that, that would be actually uh, basically one-to-one marketing. So, you know, understanding how each customer 
received your ad and consumed your ad and when they saw it and then automating the next step always, all being part of a story, right? So every customer sees kind of the same story that you want to be communicated, but sees one point at the right time. So, you know, like not see the third ad unless they saw the first and the second, right? So having yeah, this sort, sort of storytelling. Yeah, I think that that'd be really interesting. One question that is going to be, I mean, I know that is a problem now and a question that to be addressed is how are brands going to be able to uh, manage their databases and the data that they hold of customers and the different data from different platforms in a singular point so that they can use that effecti- effectively to achieve this more tailored advertising? There already are platforms for that. Okay. Uh, which, which ones? Uh, which ones? Uh, do you know are doing a good uh, job at this? Google. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, Google and Facebook. Okay. Uh, no, but like seriously, Google. In Google, I think you can tap into with their uh, with their new Firebase based uh, tools uh, and their really cheap AIs and stuff like that. I think you can store data quite easily. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying it's easy as in anyone can do it. Mm-hmm themselves you might need an expert you might need a tech guy you might need a tech marketing guy something like that to be able to set up a database that uh, where you can push data from all sorts of sources in but but google's genuinely a, a good place to do that now uh of course if you're working lower level in the ad space there are a lot of protocols used in the ad in the advertising world to move ads across and to keep client data and customer data and so on and so forth uh you can integrate these within Google or any other tool that you have. Like this is the lower level. This is, uh, this is, this goes deeper and they're really, really complicated things. So, and, but they exist for a reason. Like they track uh, how much time a person views an ad, the type of reaction you can tap into all of these data sources. They're huge and they're a standard across the advertising world. Mm -hmm. That's the cool thing. They're a standard. So looking at the the campaigns that we run for people today, because I'm trying to, um, I mean, this, I'm trying to link this very techy part of marketing with the things that are happening more at the moment and see how this can be scaled maybe or can be adapted more to a more digital world. So at the moment, for example, some of the more mainstream campaigns that we run for people are, for example, if we take social, it would be through the AIDA model, so attention, interest, desire, action. Uh, we try to take customers through that by having... Um, automation rules for delivery and then for example targeting people with specific ads based on how much of a video let's say they watched before and then creating sort of a funnel like that and then also we have google then where we have affinity audiences and we can target people based on what they searched in the past week um or uh, what interest they have uh, age and so on and another thing for social would be for example targeting people that on that expressed or have done specific actions in the platform, such as press on buttons like shop now and so on, which are seen as being engaged shoppers. So in e-commerce, that's very good. And it's a nice trick to actually make your delivery more efficient. But then where the challenge is, is capturing all the relevant data from Google and then understanding how the same customers interacted, for example, in Facebook and putting these two together in order to make sure that you have a cohesive journey on Google and Facebook, let's say, because, okay, email marketing, that can work. And that usually is capturing data from email and the way that they interact with your brand on specific on specific platforms. But then again, each data table has a unique key ID and that's what a customer is being identified on. And generally at the moment, that unique ID is an email address. Uh, if I'm not wrong, I think that Google does the same for, for customers. I think it's by by their email address. So um, do you have any ideas of how we might be able to integrate this data better? Or for your research for Daimly, did you find maybe some gaps that can be filled? Or So one thing that we want to set out to do with Daimly does attack this in a certain sense. Uh, it doesn't, I don't think right now we help with the overarching of uh, the existence of all of these platforms. But one thing that we do want to do is make serving ads easier for people, like much easier to understand or mm-hmm. to do. Um, 
that's why we set out to do everything with a single screenshot. That's what you promote. So you can take a screenshot of a post that you made on an Instagram story for your business and upload it directly and run it as an ad. And you can run it as an ad for free. And then our algorithms will see based on people's reaction to that ad, we'll, we'll find you a target market that reacted best to your ad or to your product. Um, <clears throat> now, there are discussions about being able to plug in loads of other advertising platforms into uh, into Dimly, and whatever it's gonna, whatever platform allows you to tap into these multiple sources, they have means of extracting data that you can use in a single place. I don't, I don't use anyone in particular now. Like I don't use any platform that allows me to basically to oversee a Google ad campaign or a Facebook campaign from within this secluded, you platform. name it, platform. Oh, yeah, oh, Android. Oh, I think- try to do that but the last time uh, we were discussing with them they haven't really achieved it to that level yeah it's definitely not easy because of how uh, much google and facebook want to protect all of these things but uh, i think if i'm not mistaken that should this is something that should be done before that layer so before you actually set up an ad campaign on facebook or on google you should have your target markets all of these things and the only thing that you extract is are are the results like how well it worked for a certain segment and then you can optimize for that but then again how do you automate the storytelling through that so i mean you know who your target market is that's okay and you know how it looks as a segment okay but then how do you achieve the one-to-one marketing so that you can create a funnel of ads and based on where they consume oh there's no way that's done yet no yeah No, no that's that's not done yet for sure because it's not it's not a need yet. People are still uh, desperately trying to figure out how they can optimize their pixel to sell a little bit more, uh, and that's like really that that's really instant gratification type of things. Uh, what I'm talking about is going to first be experimented by bigger companies who can afford to not sell. Sorry, who can afford the risk of not selling within the first advertising campaign, um, in order to build up and generate hopefully more sales in the latter ones. Um, but in order to be able to pull that off, one thing I know for sure is that the infrastructure is there. Like fundamentally the tools that Facebook themselves or Google themselves use to serve ads across different channels, across different websites, they are, uh, performant enough to be able to handle an advertising campaign that's done one-to-one across multiple platforms by different people, Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, towards different people. But it's just not a feature that's sold yet. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think right now you would have to do it manually with an agency that takes care of it for you. Yeah, so all these funnels usually are being integrated, as you said, manually. Yeah. Um, so now let's let's move up now and try to have like a bird's eye view on the discussion because we went into the nitty gritty and into the you know mm-hmm. the okay. detail. But uh, let's look at the market. So tradition before COVID, we had um, obviously brands that were continuing the same approach to marketing mostly as they did, let's say, two or three years ago in a market that was already changing a lot and innovating a lot. Um, Obviously, we had more corporate brands that could afford to lose some budgets to test, but also they they were not adaptive enough in order to change to to other platforms that they would quick enough, let's say, within a matter of weeks or months. So um, right now, what is likely to happen over the last, let's say, April, May, is that the digital space eventually will be flooded with loads more advertising and loads of brands might be just doing what they were doing traditionally, just like pushing ads and say, buy this without having the sort of funnel strategy to deliver advertising. So um, apart from potentially an increase in the cost per ad delivery per click or whatever the metric is that a brand would be following. Another risk could be for people to start getting enough of these ads that you know don't serve a real value, and then to build up this um, uh, resistance and you know like to have um, this stigma against uh, seeing ads more and more growing within them. Yeah, definitely. That's that's to be honest. That's one of the reasons why uh, the first uh, version of Dimly is a Tinder-like place for ads because uh, we get we get the right to say that, all right, 
are you uncertain that if you run an ad on a mainstream advertising platform that sifts your ad through other pieces of content that people watch, how do you know that people have not had enough of watching ads in general? So your ad is going to be seen, but people are so sick of seeing ads that they're not going to react to it. Whereas we serve ads in a place where people literally open an app literally to see ads. Like that's the purpose for them opening this app, right? And, and the purpose, of, the reason why these people open this app is to get ads that are as tailored as possible to them. And they have a financial incentive, especially at the beginning, to do so. Uh, so we get, we get a hedge on all of this and we get to say, we get to say that, that that doesn't matter for us because mm-hmm. people only come to our app to see ads. So as long as we have users, the people that are there, the people that are swiping on these ads, they're there to see ads. Um, as for the the fear or the how it will evolve into in the mainstream advertising marketplace, I think that's you're completely right. The first thing that's going to happen is going to be an increase of cost mm-hmm. of whatever metric is relevant because there's going to be a flood of of new ads, um, and then people will start being sick of ads. But the increase of cost elevates the barrier of entry, so. The increase of cost is gonna be is gonna make sure that they're it's not it's not gonna sorry, it's not gonna make sure it's gonna create a likely scenario that they're gonna be less ads. That's that's what an increase of cost does economically. So there's gonna be a flood of ads, then the increase of cost, then the flood kind of reduces because it's much more expensive to run an ad. But because it's a marketplace, if the flood reduces, then because the price only increases when the budgets are pumped into the platform. If the budgets are not there, then the price drops. This is why, yeah, I agree. It's there's always an up and down, up and down. It's a sinus, but uh, this is why I think the discussion that we're having at the brainstorming and that we should carry on uh, each of us to ourselves as well and everyone at home. Mm-hmm. It's because the only solution to this sort of trap, in which all right now there's going to be a flood of of people moving towards online advertising, the price is going to go up, and then of course. It's going to be too expensive for some people. It's going to go down, but then up again, because that's, that's what we're currently dealing with. This is why we need to think uh, and turn this into a positive sum game. And the only way it can be turned into a positive sum game, sorry, there are two ways. It's first of all, platforms like Google or Facebook figuring out new ways to show these ads in a place where they have no competition before or turning them smarter or making them more efficient or new players coming in and figuring out new ways to serve ads like I think we talked about, but not on a podcast, uh, the people that the, the company that wants to serve ads within Netflix shows that are tailored mm-hmm. to people, right? That's a new way. That's a positive sum game. All of a sudden, that's a that's a new place where you can serve an ad. Uh, if if for instance the ads there are going to be served by Google, yeah, which is fine. I I mean I'm a capitalist. Uh, <laughs> uh, if the ads there are going to be served by Google, it will in, help in making the cost per action per deliverable cheaper. Because there are more place, there's more places even for Google to show ads. Mm-hmm. It's a new market even for Google. And that's fine. It will, the outcome will be the same. Well, Google is going to have an incentive to keep the cost as high as possible. But <laughs> leaving that aside, um, we, need to think, we need to be thinking of these new, what are these new opportunities, these new places to, to advertise things to people? And we need to stop making the word, seeing the word advertising as so stigmatic. Like I'm seeing this with Daimly. Wherever we say like on our mock-ups of documents or websites, like show an ad to the relevant people. Everyone's like, ah, what do you do? There's this cringe behind the, the terminology, but fuck that for now because we are in this space. They are ads. No matter how sugar-coated they are and how nice they are for people to enjoy, they're fucking ads. So we can still safely refer to them as ads. Yeah, I, I think there's, um, going back to the consumption behavior and stuff, uh, I think that you mentioned the routines are going to be replaced. And actually we can, uh, for the people that, for example, would not be commuting anymore or would be carrying on their day-to-day life in a slightly different way. I think that um, this opens, first of all, I'm happy to see more people being more involved with, uh, you know, having a meditation routine or doing some sort of sport like yoga or maybe jogging a bit more, even though you can't, it's not really good to do it now. But, you know, being more aware of their... uh, own rituals. I think that, for example, a nice opportunity would be to, many people are doing it from home. Yeah. So, you know, they're following um, YouTube or buying courses. I think that maybe brands trying to tap into that in a nice manner, not to say, okay, buy me now, but some sort of product placement, like advertising in these new routines would be nice to happen. 
Yeah, but the 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 true question is how. Let's let's define a, a mock up a mock up routine, right? Actually, no. Let's not define a mock up routine. What's your routine? What do you do now? So you're you're at home for two weeks. What do you do in the morning? I'm home for six. <laughs> so um, oh shit, it's six weeks. Holy fuck! Yeah, I've been home for six weeks too. Damn. Yeah, from from the beginning of March. Fuck. Anyway, so what do you do? What do you do? <laughs> so uh, wake up. Uh, it takes like five minutes to wake up. Then um, meditate ten minutes. Uh, well, brush my teeth. Then meditate for ten fifteen minutes. Um, breakfast. Um, I'm usually quickly going through the news uh, related to the market and stuff. So uh, depending on the hour that I'm waking up. Uh, if the market opens, then I'm looking to see where it opened and then stuff to do with stocks and with financial stuff. Uh, but that's like five minutes. And then... Um, Are you sure you're not just lying now for like... Uh, no, no, no. That's, to see like you have... Because right now, I'm quite sure Bill Gates does the same thing. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I, no, no, not Bill Gates. Definitely not Bill Gates. No. Gary Vader. <laughs> no, you can ask my girlfriend. <laughs> she, yeah, she's, <laughs> she's seeing me every day. So that and then... Uh, going into so i'm not doing sports in the morning unfortunately i never was able to uh just because i can't get myself in the awake enough uh and then just uh going to slack and seeing because usually because i'm two hours later than our team in romania uh they are already starting at like here would be seven o'clock so um at around 8 30 ish i'm going on email and on slack and starting to get the day started all right. Any opportunities that you see out across here, like, but realistically speaking, for a new for a new type of way to serve ads to you, I, the reason why I'm not talking about my morning routine is that it's just so. For the past six years, it's been exactly the same. I wake up, I take a piss, I brush my teeth, and then I go to work. Like I do not, I do nothing else at all ever. Now the only difference is that I go go down these stairs, go to the bathroom. <laughs> and then come back and sit at this computer. And apart from that, it would have been, I go to the bathroom, I come back, get dressed, get in the car and leave. I don't eat, I don't do anything ever. So uh, one way that potentially could be good or a pot- an opportunity to advertise better would be if you know that, let's say you are a f- um, B2B services or a financial brand type of business and you are advertising through display ads, placing the display ads in a programmatic way during those specific times on the specific websites that are relevant, like uh, like the Wall Street Journal or stuff like that. But, you know, in a more intelligent way and uh, programmed way, that could be an opportunity. Then, even though I'm personally not a big fan, there might be people that don't mind uh, hearing a little or seeing a little ads in their app when they are opening, for, opening it for meditation purposes. Um, so maybe these sort of things, because I'm not watching TV and I'm not watching YouTube in the morning, but at the same time, probably most people do. So maybe I'm just like a one thing. One percent. One thing that we're uh, discussing at Timely is um, figuring out a way to make micro influencing more mainstream and more of a standardized means of of promoting things. Um, And I realized that this fits in perfectly here into this part of discussion, because let's face it, serving ads on Wall Street Journal at a specific time is something that people are already going to be doing. It's something that the algorithm is going to be doing itself because they're going to, they figure out that the point of the surge of traffic is changing. So nothing really needs to change for that to happen. Uh, But you were talking earlier about product placement. I think right now the biggest problem with product placement is how much of a how much of a thing it is. Like you need 50,000 million disclaimers that you're doing product placement. Mm-hmm. And then it's companies are so desperate to do product placement because, because of all of these procedures, which increase cost of product placement campaigns to run as a company, companies want it done biblically. Like remember the Bud Light uh, thing, like you always had to have the Bud Light facing the thing. As if right now, anyone who would see a Bud Light wouldn't know as long as it's sold in their local markets, would know that it's a Bud Light, right? I think if we had an automated way to monitor, to, to pay people for promoting a product that they genuinely like, genuinely lose in a way, in a way in which it's not actual promotion, like right now, let's take a look. 
you can see there's an where the hell there's an Xbox right there. Uh huh. Right. I didn't do anything uh, apart from now. I didn't do anything to promote it. But if you're if you're watching this podcast for like an hour, you you can learn so many things about me. You can learn that I've got two microphones. So I probably did something uh, in the past about this. I've got one display here. You can see that I'm a tech guy. You can see what display I'm using. For instance, here, uh, what TV I have there, the Xbox, all sorts of things. If you if you like me as a person and there's an engagement done around here, I can be a referral salesman without even wanting to be. Like, there, I think there's an untapped uh, opportunity in, in, in literally the best marketing stream known to man, and that's word of mouth. I think we have an opportunity to, to tap into word of mouth uh, in a more of a standardized human-like way, however. So standardized meaning that you should be able to monetize it, to track it, to be able to see how it actually works, to get some data from it, but without really going so deep into people's lives as to having me sit here with 50,000 Bud Lights all facing towards the screen. Right? And of course, it can be cheaper. Like if, for instance, I'm going to give a really dumb example, but really just to serve a point. Yeah? If somebody likes the way this headlight looks in this video, yeah, which is, this is a video targeted for people who have a business, who they're doing things, right? Or they want to get into things. They we're, not, we're not talking to couch potatoes here. And if you are, get the fuck. No, no I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but no, but get up, get up off the couch. <laughs> but if, if someone buys a BMW based on this video, because you're like, oh, damn, does it actually look like that? Like, does they like, and the millions of dollars that BMW spent into ads, of course, they're not worthless because that's how people know about BMW and so on and so forth. But if this was the trigger for people buying a BMW, then Maybe BMW should just go automatically without even having to do anything allocated from some sort of budget because I don't mind having these things around going, yo, Stefan, here's five bucks. You helped us sell, you helped us sell a car today. And this can be done completely in the background. I can just receive my money. I don't have to, because otherwise getting paid for shit like this has a huge stigma towards it. I honestly, right now, if someone were to buy a BMW based on seeing that headlamp there, I don't want BMW to go, Thank you. Here's $5 because I would feel like, get the fuck. I don't, well, I don't want you. <laughs> but at the end of the day, if it were a passive process done in the background and simply based on the, the, the way our lives are set up, I think it would be quite cool. And I think it's a new avenue. I think that maybe that could be implemented because I think it'd be really, really hard to have a mechanism to automate that. But maybe uh, IoT could um, contribute to that and the smart home. So the way that you, for example, interact with specific devices like asking Alexa about something after you maybe consumed content on another platform and then trying to identify your journey as a customer Mm -hmm. towards purchase and then integrating that with a brand. Here's another thing. Yeah, with more brands. A fundamental belief or philosophy that I have come across while working on Daimly is that people are too protective about data. I think there needs to be Sorry, not really. I don't want this to come out wrong. <laughs> not, 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 not the individuals are protective of, about their data. I don't mean that. I think people are, people should be protective of their own data. I mean companies. Companies, after they have certain data about certain people, they're really protective about it. That's one of the reasons why it's very hard right now to do what you just asked me earlier. How do you get like? How do you track the people that you have on your Facebook ads to plug them into Google? Like, they're at the end of the day, they're the same people. Why? Why don't I have access to this information? Is because Facebook and Google don't want you. To. And it makes sense for them financially right now to not want you to. But if you look at it from a long-term game perspective, I think it would be good to have a platform out there that's available for all of us, transparent to all of us, where people can, a marketplace for data or a place where people can store their data, as I said before, transparently and and using a technology that people can trust or people don't have to trust uh, and where everyone can tap into. You know, it's just like, I think it would be the equivalent of time. Time is a resource that all of us collectively have access to. It's super democratic yeah, to all of us. Uh, we all have it to a certain extent. It matters how each of us use it. Uh, and it's not controlled by anyone. You know, I think that data should be the same sort of thing, but you know, data is smarter than time because it's much more multidimensional. <laughs> but you know, uh, one question that just occurred to me now would be, that platform, or one thing, that platform should actually be tuned into all the platforms that you use in order to collect your data. You know, everyone, everyone way. should everyone should take out data and put data back into this whole thing whenever they exactly. want. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, because you don't. I mean, you don't know what 
your data in Facebook looks like because that data is the whole accumulation of, I don't know, 10 years of surfing through pages, liking pages, commenting, whatever you did. So uh, that's a lot of data. And yeah, and I'm not saying... I'm not saying Facebook shouldn't be able to monetize that data. Mm -hmm. Sure, Facebook should monetize the data. It's there, right? Like the certain things that they learned about me, there may be things that even I don't know. For sure. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's definitely their work that, that they put in to be able to achieve that result. I'm not saying that they shouldn't, that I should just have free access to all of this data just because it's, it's, uh, it should be open. No, I'm saying I should pay for it. Mm -hmm. But I should be able to have access to it if I, if I have the purchasing power uh, to be able to reward Facebook for their work. And at the end of the day, I should have access to that data because I I believe it's a it's an open resource. Like for Daimly, I have no issue whatsoever in all of the data that we're processing um, to to make it available for people transparently, to make it available for people if the individual is okay with it, for instance. And if he's not, he can disable that data point within Daimly and we no longer collect that and he can delete it. That's fine. But whatever data is out there, I want it to be up for grabs for, for people because it, it's going to be a resource that, is, yeah, of course, I believe data is super important. So that doesn't come as a surprise. But I believe data is going to be the resource that enables us to move forward as a species. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's the one key fundamental resource like time, like energy, like these sorts of things that we made. Like it only exists because we kind of set it up to exist. Mm -hmm. And we can learn so much from it. But in order to be able to learn so much from it, you have to have access to it. And cheap access as well. So that's why, that's why it should be a market. Because if it's an open market, the principles of capitalism uh, kind of should help ensure that it's accessible. Yeah. Okay, so if we were to think about uh, just trying to link this back to the subject or to, to try to get to some action points or some things that can be you know, taken away, and maybe applied or brainstormed on by the actual people that are listening to us today. So um, looking at data and then the way that it is used within marketing today, it's very likely that many brands will start to put a bigger accent on analyzing it better, delivering ads better and so on. So that would that would probably be one of the changes that we would see accelerated because it was happening anyway, but maybe not at the actual exactly. speed that yeah, I agree. Um, and then a question here and an action point for the people that are listening to us would be, how do you manage your data? I mean, do you know how your audience interacts with your brand? Do you know uh, where they consume content best? Do you, do you know if you produce the best content for them? Because what I saw in many, many cases is that uh, lots of brands and not only small ones or startups were producing content that they liked, but that was not performing very well for their audience, even though it was pr all pretty and, uh, you know, like the creative team was very proud of it and it was looking good, but it was just not the type of content that would sell the actual product. So maybe one takeaway from this would be to move that perspective a bit and look at how you produce content, how you communicate and how your customers interact with you and also how you store and build your database from specific data points and then organizing it in such a way that is more scalable and it, you are building upon data and not just creating a, a pool of random uh, information. Yeah, I'm not saying this is a, as a pitch right now. Uh, it's, it is gonna be a pitch, but it, doesn't, it really doesn't cost that much. I think between a, a, a 10 and 20K budget, if you, have, if you have a company that's working with quite a lot of data that's offline right now or online, but it's not smart, to get a tech team such as ours, but of course anyone out there uh, to, to tap it into, uh, to use Google's uh, AI tools that are now available, they're really cheap. Uh, and you can learn a lot of things about how you segment your market from there, how, you, what, what, what you, what, how much uh, further can you monetize your existing client base, these sorts of things. Do, they, they're quite quick as long as you have data to tap in. Uh, so, Stefan, do you have any case studies that we can put in the description here, or for example, for people that don't know exactly what's available to them? Because maybe they didn't. We can. Do that I much. can provide a list of tools. I can't because we have ongoing clients that that we do this with now. I can't mention who they are, but I uh, I can provide a list of a list of tools so that people can see the principle that I'm talking about. It's mm -hmm. literally within Google's new Firebase. The uh, Kit, you have certain AI components that mm -hmm. let you learn from the data that you plug into it. And they're really easy to set up. 
Super. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if you can share some links after after sure. this, and then I'll I'll put them in the in the description, and you guys can have a look there and see what's mm-hmm. possible, and maybe if it's something for you, uh, and you'd like to discuss it with Stefan, uh, I'm gonna place uh, your links, Stefan, as well in the description, and I guess people can also link directly to you with you if sure. Yeah, of course. I'll put up my email address, and I don't. I, I like people talking to me directly. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Super. Okay. Um, so that would be one of the things. And then um, we were also discussing, but we didn't bring it up in the in the podcast and in the episode, specific technologies and how they might suit to the new ways of living or of consuming media. For uh, here, let's get straight into the subjects of uh, in our discussion before. It was VR and how this might be growing very fast in the in the next. Uh, couple of months maybe so um one of the crazy things right now is that entertainment obviously is very much down offline and everything kind of moved online and we see some of the crazy things that i was seeing lately were for example um clubs (laughs) that you online clubs basically that you had to pay to enter to be like in a club but online also there has been a growth in uh, game cons- like online games consumption and we already know that many of the online games can be played through uh VR he- headsets or there are specific games for VR headsets so it's very much expected that people might start to purchase this more as well as to, as well as to consume um entertainment through this uh, technology so this might be a very good opportunity for brands maybe to see how such technologies might apply to them as well or to the way that they communicate with clients because the market is going to be very more much more open to them as technologies in the near future um stefan what do you think do you do you have clients that are using new technologies such as those ones or through your work with the disruptive disruptive technologies in general no but that's mostly because most of our efforts right now are in Romania, where I think that's slightly lagging behind. Uh, a lot of, I have a really close friend, Alexi, who I was uh, partners with in uh, Oris, my last company, mm-hmm. uh, who is right now working with a VR company in the Netherlands, and they're really blowing up. Like they have one of these rooms where you have loads of uh, VR headsets and different VR technologies. Um, and they're seeing so many games or worlds, universe, entire universes or worlds being set up right now in VR, specifically because people can't go outside. And I think that's a great idea. I mean, yeah, it does make sense. I don't know why we didn't bring it up in the podcast so far. It's super straightforward. It's also straightforward as a new way to advertise. Like mm-hmm. people are going to be living within these within these fake virtual worlds, which I think there was a lot of stigma on because of Matrix and all these things. Like, oh my God, you're going to be staying at home with a headset on your head and leaving out a world. I have only one thing to say. I'm not a stigmatic person per se. I understand where stigma comes from, but I am very future oriented. To all of these people that feel that way, like, I don't want, what about the sensation of touch? Fucking try it. Just try it out once to see what it's like to fly or some shit like that in the VR <laughs> world, to be a human that can fly and you interact with other people. And you'll see that it's really not that bad. Uh, I, I, think that's a, I think that's a great idea. Even, yeah, clubs, why not? I mean, we don't know what we're going to end up learning from all of these sorts of different experiences. Um, I'm, I'm really curious how, what does the club douchebag do in VR? Yeah. <laughs> I, haven't is, yet, I haven't yet paid to get, to get into an online club. <laughs> I'm, I'm genuinely curious now. Like I'm genuinely curious. So I think a few opportunities are going to arise from this. Yes, definitely promote VR oriented things, but do it. I, w- I would go product first because VR requires the cost of, it's a cost of entry. You need to buy the hardware to get into it. Yep. So I think that arises for two different types of businesses, either leasing VR headsets, but that's going to be a problem now because people don't want to touch things other people have. Uh, or So therefore finding an interesting, safe model to not have to purchase something that might be expensive for some people, like a VR headset. Uh, then there are the cheaper VR kits, like the ones that you do with your phone and the cardboard thing i'm not sure how well they work or they tap into these technologies or these platforms i don't think they do um and then advertising within these vr worlds right now i'm quite sure there is no standardized way so there's no google ads integrated into the billboards created in a virtual world but Mm -hmm. i'll bet my bottom dollar that that's going to be a thing and it's going to be a thing soon yeah very very probable and also another thing that has started to emerge now i saw this repeatedly over the past 
couple of weeks is traditional businesses such as gyms that are moving online and are allowing people to have memberships or to pay a fee or you know to have zoom uh trainings with a trainer in the gym yeah think- world class does that they, they they froze my subscription and they're sending me like workout videos and classes online they're all, they've moved everything on their online platform quite quickly mm-hmm. so yeah yeah, I think that that's a very good opportunity. And also a point that we can make here is that if before you were a very offline focused, no digital presence business, this might be a, and your industry is like that, then this might be an excellent point and an excellent moment for you to quickly move online and to become, uh, as Stefan, you were saying this uh, in one of our previous discussions, to become the person in that space. So uh yeah. Do you want to talk about your example? Because I thought that that was very... The one yeah, the- sure. I think um, we're surrounded, like both of you and I, we're surrounded by friends that are entrepreneurs. And I have lots of people calling me right now going, yo, we got we to gotta move this business online. Uh, and because they're going to sell so much right now in this period, they're going to sell so much. And the reality of the matter is, no, they're not going to sell so much. Because again, there's a, there's a stigma. Sorry, this, sorry, no, no, it's not a stigma. My bad. Uh, people just don't want to buy things right now. They want to take it chill. They're not desperate to buy things. So it's not, the, the picture was painted wrong by all of these hyper-enthusiastic entrepreneurs. The opportunity that I do see though, uh, is this is the period of time to invest all of the money that you want to invest into moving into the digital world. Uh, if you're an offline business, because you can take the throne of the online equivalent of that industry. So right now, for instance, I gave the, I, in our talk, uh, I gave, um, the example of a flower shop, mm-hmm. right? I don't know what flower shop I can buy flowers from now online. I, I know exactly where I bought flowers from offline. I would not mind to buy, to buy flowers online. I didn't do it before because I never took the time to research it because flowers were such an on my way sort of thing. Like I always knew if I leave my house, I've got this flower shop Nala, uh, to stop by. And I don't know what is the king of online, uh, of online flower shops. If right now, a bigger flower shop that would of course have the resources for it, but whatever, whatever flower shop wants to, wants to do this or flower shop, uh, bakery, you name it, mm-hmm. any offline business with no online presence in which the industry doesn't really have online presence. That's the, that's a key factor. If they would make an online platform and throw a fuck tons of ads into my face, even though I've never clicked on an ad before and I would never click on their ads, at least I would understand. I would get to know that, Oh wait, if I want pretzels online, if I want flowers online, this is the brand to do it with now. Like right now, I'm looking out for these sorts of things. I think people are looking out because they, people know that there's going to be a future in which more things are going to happen online. So we need a stock of information of, of businesses uh, that, that do exist online. And I think that's the great niche to tackle right now. And I think that's worth investing, even though your ads are not going to have a financial return up front. Yeah, 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 that's a really good point to, to be made. I think that's super important because people are looking at moving online for the wrong reasons and surfing ads online for the wrong reasons. I, I wouldn't do ads online right now to desperately sell. I would do ads right now to become the online player in my region in that specific niche that has not been online before. And also, it might, be, it might also be the case that it is possible for this to be the cheapest you can do so. Because the more brands are going to move into online, not, ne- not necessarily in that specific niche, but also as a, as a whole movement, then obviously it's going to be happening what, it, what we discussed earlier, which would be an inflation in price and also a bigger competition on specific audiences and that and so on. So apart from just having a very well-organized uh, way of delivering ads and understanding what your audience is interested in and when they consume ads on which platforms, it's also important to see... Uh, if you are capitalizing this space enough and what your competition is in that space. And if it's room for you to become more present or to invest more in order to gain that authority, then it's, it might be the case that now is the cheapest time that you can do it. So the cost of opportunity is very, very good. Yeah. 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 Cool. Awesome. So now we have the action points. We have a lot of discussion here. So for everybody that stayed with us until now, thank you very much. And we hope that uh, we sparked some ideas and there's a bunch of stuff that you now have uh, inspiration and time to think about. Uh, If you guys have questions specifically about the subjects, because we know we went into the nitty gritty quite a bit in 
for specific subjects, feel free to reach out to us directly and uh, whichever of us is relevant for that specific subject. So obviously for, for the very technology, te- technology oriented uh, things, I invite you to reach out to Stefan and I'm going to pop the details for him in the description below. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be happy, to, both of us, to to help you or to answer your questions. And as well, um, if there are subjects that you would like us in the future to focus on or to discuss in more depth specifically that you think are relevant for your business or for your network, then let us know and we'll do our best to organize a future episode where we discuss those specific subjects. So this was a more of a brainstorm thing, but if we, uh, if it helps you to go in and analyze uh, specific subjects, then just let us know. Stefan, it was a great pleasure to have you on uh, the podcast again. Thank you for making the time. Thanks for the invite. My pleasure as oh, well. A pleasure always, always. And very much looking forward to meeting again in real life. I, I feel, yeah, six weeks, is, six weeks is quite a ton of time. I didn't realize until I verbalized it today. Yeah, me neither. Like, honestly, that was genuinely genuine. <laughs> cool, man. <laughs> cool, man. Have a top, uh, have a top time. Have a top weekend. Uh, guys, you as well have an awesome day and looking forward to meeting again soon. Thank you. Are you quarantined? Bye-bye. Bye.